So you see we're switching gears here a little bit. Um, and today is about the future of work. And wow, right? Like how passionate can, do you have to be to do your job in that kind of way? Because let's be honest, all of us or anybody can do their job like unengaged and slow. But that level, you have to be kind of passionate about it. Unfortunately, most people are not that passionate in their work. 85% of people are apparently not engaged. Imagine that. That means out of every 10 of your co-workers, eight and a half are not engaged. That's like terrible. That means like, how are you supposed to grow and have fun if hardly anyone's engaged there? So that's not just bad for companies, it's bad for everybody. And maybe some people, probably not you, but many people say like, oh, but I can't do anything about that. I'm just an employee. I'm not like, this isn't my company. I'm not a team leader. So what am I supposed to do about it? And so I'm here today to challenge that, to say everybody can do something to make the future of work amazing and to help our workplaces become better. The whole thing of like designing a workplace and thinking about how we work together is called new work. And it means nothing else apart from building the organization in a way that people can do their best kind of work. And what is an organization? An organization isn't just the management or the leaders. Everybody in the organization is the organization, which in turn means also everybody should do, be able to do something to make the work environment better. I've done in my life a lot of thinking and testing and failing and succeeding around organizational design. And so maybe a bit about me, or, oh no, sorry, before we go there, before we go there um, like when you think about organizational design, a lot of people think this, you know, they think um, the ping pong table or the free lunches or whatever. Um, but let's be honest, how many of you are really more engaged at work because there's a ping pong table in the office? Not really, right? I mean, it makes for a nice environment, but it doesn't change our intrinsic motivation. So, and now we come to the point, a um, bit about me. Um, I'm the founder of Career Foundry. Uh, we are a design school based here in Berlin. We, well, we do mostly UX trainings online, also UI trainings. And our, yeah, our focus is to help people change careers or upskill in their careers. We have a couple of grads here tonight who've come from like no experience to senior designer. So maybe if Nilo can raise your hand so you can chat to her afterwards as well. Um, and yeah, with Career Foundry, we have 50 employees here in Berlin. Um, and I left the company end of last year and started a new company. And it's called Wild Wild Ventures. And it's literally like, yeah, a way for me to realize all of my crazy ideas. At the moment, I have two brands online. One brand has 81 variations. The other brand has two. So I'm pretty busy at the moment. Um, and in this journey of my, on, in this entrepreneurial journey of the last seven years, um, I didn't get, just get to meet some famous people also. Um, but I also helped a lot of students obviously, obviously succeed in their careers. And mostly, when I started my company, my first one, I really wanted to build an amazing place to work. I had had some really bad career um, experiences myself. I had bad bosses and I really wanted to build an amazing place. I became interested in how to build um, and how to design an organization in 2011. I was asked by Rocket Internet, which is the company behind Zalando and behind um, Delivery Hero and many companies that you know, to move to China and start a company for them in China. Um, so I was 24 at the time. I moved to Beijing and it was just insane. We grew from 40 people when I arrived there to 3,000 people within six months. It was so intense that you often had to be in the office before 8 a.m. Otherwise, you couldn't get a chair. The HR department just couldn't get enough chairs because there were so many people. That's how crazy it was. But what was even crazier, there was a drive there, like an excitement that I have never seen anywhere at work. And I was like, wow, how do you get that kind of excitement and spirit into a company? And so I started thinking, what is drive, actually? I mean, it's a cool word, right? But what is it? Do you have any idea what, it's, what, what causes drive? Passion. Passion? Mm-hmm. Energy. Energy. Mission. Mission. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, there's a famous um, New York best-selling author called, called Daniel Pink, and he did lots of studies, and he says drive comes from th three things. Autonomy, so that we can be fairly autonomous in our work. Mastery, that we master what we do. And purpose. And now careful, purpose doesn't always mean, oh, I have to change the world. I have to, um, I don't know, clean the ocean. Pur pur purpose can be a lot of things. It can be, oh, I just want to make my company more successful. Purpose does, can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So, and here comes number one, you know, if you know anyone who's not very happy in their work, you know, it's not, it's not just the company who's supposed to help them. It can also be that they ask, how can I get more autonomy, mastery and purpose in my job? What can I do for that? So that's one thing that everybody can do for a greater future of work. So um, new work can be a lot of things. So here you see my building blocks, what I think is important. So I have engagement, I have drive, which is important for me in a work environment where I am. And so when I think about employee experiences or like my ideal work environment, that's where I would want to be. By the way, do we have some designers in the room tonight? Yeah, I thought so. We're at the design lab. Um, and you know, you as designers, you might be much more involved in this future of work thing than you can think today. Because studies show that 51% of CEOs say that yeah, an employee experience is the key for the future of work for them. So basically, right now, you might be building customer experiences helping the company be customer focused, but in future we'll work with employees the same way. They will really see them as a key stakeholder and build a really literally experiences for them. So anyways, I came back to Germany after Rocket Internet and I knew I wanted to found a company. I just didn't have the right idea yet. So I started working at Axel Springer, which is a media company here in Berlin. And that was the first year that their revenues from the digital business were larger than the revenues from the print business. So what did they do? They invested a lot of money into digital and they tried to hire 150 developers and designers. Now a lot of you are designers and some developers and you know how hard it is to find these kind of people. I love this quote which says there will be plenty of jobs in the future, we just won't have the skills to do them. And that's something that's already happening today. Guess how many IT jobs we have vacant in, or we have opened in Germany last year. Almost 100,000 jobs open and at the same time, you know, there's so many people who worry that they will lose their jobs because of technology. There's still about 6 million unemployed young people in Europe and we have 100,000 jobs that are well paid with great futures. Crazy, no? There's really something wrong in our world. So I think continuous learning is something that's really important. Like if we as people, if organizations can't manage to get people to learn constantly, we'll all lose. Unfortunately, you see 13% of employees rate le learning as not important to them. So that's pretty bad. So again, you know, we had a team in Career Foundry um, and they started a book club, really simple. So they met once a month um, to read a book uh, and not just any book, but a book that really helped them increase in their job. And that's something anyone can do. It's not very costly. So I think the continuous learning is on everybody to help the, the work environment become a better place. So it's another one. So when that happened and I realized, wow, they're hiring so many people and these are, these are all well-paid well jobs and people don't have the skills, I literally had one of these enlightenment moments. Have you ever had a moment like that when you literally start feeling like you're flowing over the air, cross-legged? hovering over your desk like that. That's how I felt in that moment. I was like, wow, that's a huge problem for the world. I want to do something about this problem. I want to help people get these amazing careers. So that's how we started out. I found a co-founder and we said in my small kitchen in Berlin Mitte, back then that was 2013, I lived in a flat chair. And you can imagine my flatmates were not exactly happy that we were in the kitchen all day long trying to build our startup. Um, but we did it. And then that's a couple of years later um, as a billboard we had at Alexanderplatz. And we literally built, over the last six years, one of the largest um, UX schools, online UX schools there are. 
And there were many ups and downs in our journey, as there is in any entrepreneurial journey. But today we are a profitable multi-million dollar company. We have helped thousands of students in over 80 countries worldwide. And it's been a hell of a journey. Most importantly, what I'm proud of is, you know, I did build, I think, ask my employees, a good work environment. And we are known to be like crazy experimental when it comes to how we work together. We have tried everything, and you see we were even in newspapers because of it. We tried flat hier hierarchies, where we had no managers at all anymore. We tried transparent salaries, where everybody knew what the other person was earning. We tried peer promotions, where the team could decide who got promoted, not the managers. So all pretty like edgy and cool stuff, but you know what? A lot of these things had no good effect on the culture at all. Some of these things even had really bad effect and made people less engaged than before. And I thought like, what? I'm investing so much in this. I'm really trying so hard to make, build, this, uh, build a great culture. Why is it not working? And then it struck me. And that's something Leandro said earlier as well. He said about the why in whiteboarding to go really deep into the user's problems before you think of anything else. And it's the same with employees. You really have to build a people-oriented organization. You have to go deep into what are the pain points, what are the problems, what are the frustrations, what are the motivations. And only from there, once you really understand those, start building solutions. So basically, I think it takes a mindset change that is away from, well, the management is responsible and decides what is being built in terms of culture towards, okay, let's really treat this like we would treat a customer journey. We're really building an employee journey, starting from really understanding our user, so the team. But it's not just the management who makes that mindset change. It's everybody. Because on the other hand, if the management ma makes that mindset change, the team also has to think, okay, what are the pain points of my company? What are the frustrations? What are the motivations? And how can I do something to help the company solve that? So that's my fourth building block. And now we come to my favorite points. So basically, I think there were already a couple of ideas here, what everybody can do for the future of work. But now comes my favorite, the one that I think is the most important thing everybody can do. And I just want to talk a little bit about that. And that's feedback. Now I know that's not very controversial. Probably none of you would say feedback is a bad thing. But the thing is, it's not controversial, but it's fucking hard to do in practice. <laughs> and that's why. You know those moments? <laughs> you know those moments? You're having a nice salad with a colleague and they're smiling at you with their best smile and they have a fat, big leaf in their teeth. And now you have the problem. Do you tell them that they have a leaf in their, teeth, in their tooth? And that's a bit awkward to do, but if you don't do it, they will run around with that leaf the whole day long and who God knows who they meet later on, right? So, um, and that in a company sense is called ruinous empathy. So when it comes to feedback, a company can be in one of those four quadrants. And most companies are in the ruinous empathy. That means we don't want to tell the other people where they're maybe not so good, you know, where they could improve, because we don't want to hurt their feelings. But by not telling them that feedback, we actually don't help them grow. And that's why it's ruinous, you know, we, we, without, without wanting to, we're, we're ruining their chance of growth. And what, we should, what every company should want to do is get radical candor with people where it's not a bad thing, where it's not awkward to say, hey, you have a salad leaf in, the, in between your teeth. Hey, your presentation could have been better. You know, where that is not a weird thing to do. And that's hard, that's really hard. But there are many things that, that you can do to actually do that. And like, unfortunately, that's not a manager's job, that's everybody's job. And so I had a little bit of a look, and I think that's quite funny, I had a look on Google Trends uh, you know what Google Trends are, right? It's like how many key like, yeah, keyword searches over time. And you see how to give feedback. It's actually quite a popular thing. It's growing over time. What do you think about how to receive feedback? 
So here you see now the change color, so the how to give feedback slopes up, how to receive feedback is not quite so popular. <laughs> um, and that's very human nature as well, right? But I think in order to really get a good feedback culture, in order for us growing, we need to be better in receiving feedback than giving in feedback. So basically, if you take one thing away from this talk today and this feedback and you go tomorrow to your boss and you say, oh, tomorrow I tell him or her everything they're doing wrong and what they're not good at, that might be not such a good idea. <laughs> so don't take that away from today. Um, but I think if you, if you think like, yes, you, I would like to have more feedback. I would like to help build a, a, you know, a radical candor culture, a culture where it's okay to, if, where other people help me grow, but where I can also help other people grow. Then you have to ask for feedback first. And not just once, but for weeks or months on end. Always ask for feedback. And if people like brush you off or they don't really give you the right feedback, you, um, you really have to insist and say, just tell me one thing I could have done better. And maybe after some weeks or some months, they might ask you for feedback back. And then you can give it, especially when it's about, about your boss. Don't ever give them feedback if they don't ask for it. So, you know, be careful about this. This can really make you very unpopular very quickly. So, but I mean, the re asking for feedback, that is a very safe option. Then, um, once you are at a point where you can give feedback, maybe with some of your close colleagues, maybe with your, some of your friends of, from work, do it timely. Like, don't wait for three weeks, right? Let's go back to the salad analogy, right? If somebody had a salad between their tooth and you tell them three weeks later, it's not really good, right? You have to do it timely. And then lastly, and that's actually beautiful, the flip side to um, feedback is give praise. Give praise often, because you know, if we're going to, into a world where we give critical feedback and really try to help people grow, on the other hand, we also have to give them praise for when they're doing good stuff. And that actually, yeah, and I'm talking out of experience because, you know, I told you we've did, we did all of these crazy new work things, all of these things that are really popular and in the news. And at one point we scrapped them all and, and we said, let's just focus on feedback. Let's just try to get that one thing right. And you know what it resulted in? It was amazing. We had 500% of incre increase in employee happiness and 100% increase in revenue growth within six months. So, the fa so basically, once we started to really trying to be candid and investing in each other, going over this point where it's uncomfortable and trying to help each other grow, the whole company culture improved and the revenue improved. So I want to leave you with one thought for today. First of all, you might think, how do you even measure employee happiness? And we use NPS. Any of you know NPS? Yeah, so NPS is what you often use to track customer, um, yeah, customer satisfaction. So you ask a customer, how likely would you refer our product to a friend on a scale from 1 to 10? And when they say 10, like basically the referral, referring somebody else to a product is the highest yeah, sign of sat satisfaction, product satisfaction. So we ask the employees the same thing. How likely would you um, recommend a friend to work for us as a company on a scale from 1 to 10? So now last, let me ask you, if somebody asked you, how likely would you refer a friend to your company from a scale to 1 to 10? What number would you give? And if it's not 10, which most likely it will not be, what can you do to improve that? Thank you very much. Maybe one the small thing, um, I'm launching a new product, uh, 1st of November. So if you're interested in my wild, wild journey, you can follow me on Instagram and all the other channels. And I would yeah, love to see you there and hear your questions now. <laughs>